Maeve Kelly, and where are you from? Athlone. Athlone. Thanks for coming. And I got Maeve to come up here, and I just forgot to ring her before she got here. And the lights were off. It's an old convent. <laughs> she got very scared. She thought someone was luring her somewhere nasty, I'd say. <laughs> well, how was your day? Uh, good. Good. Oh, that's Thank good. God. Thanks for coming. Ah, good. Thanks for good. Me. Thanks for coming. I was um we've been chatting back and forth on Instagram. Yeah. And I suppose the best thing would be to tell everyone who you are, a little bit of background and explain why you're here today. Well, in twenty sixteen I was in a head on road collision with a gentleman who suffered with severe unresolved mental health illness. And I was on my way into Roscommon Town to bring my daughter to bring her home from the cinema. And a man just drove straight into me. This is at night time? Yeah, 20 past 11 at night. Dark? Yeah. What kind of weather was it? Uh, the weather was quite good. Um, I remember driving in, we had CD in the car, we were singing along and we were just coming up before Hannon's Hotel in Roscommon. And I hated that On stretch. that stray? Yeah, do you know the stray yeah, where all the well. trees hang over? Yeah. And I always had a hang up over that with, you know, with the, when the bad weather and the wind, the trees, trees were fall. all coming down. So I always drove slow in that road. It was just a hang up that I had. You were, you were heading out? Yeah, heading into Roscommon. You were heading into Roscommon? Yeah. Yeah, going down the hill? Yeah. And next thing, this car overtook a line of traffic and drove, drove straight at me. Straight at you? Yeah. And can you remember, was it like, what was it like? What was the... What can you remember? I remember the lights and we were singing. We were happy, you know, myself and my daughter. She was 15 at the time. And uh, I remember putting my hand on my daughter's leg and said, Just before. What is he doing? And then I just said, we've nowhere to go. And I knew that was it. And that was it. I remembered nothing for weeks. Really? Yeah. What's the first thing you remember after that moment? Uh... Waking up in a room, um, what I now know to be the sides on a bed, in a hospital bed. Um, a gentleman, I could hear him standing over me. I now know to be the advanced paramedic who saved my life. And he introduced himself and said that he was doing a follow-up to see how I was doing. Um, not been able to answer him correctly. And when he walked away from the bed, I remember putting my hand out. He was the only... You know, when you have so many questions, because I didn't know why I was there, I didn't know what happened. And at the back of him, there was three, what I now know to be three nurses, because I hadn't a clue where I was. And they were all talking. I was trying to get people's attention. Um, that was that. That's the only recollection I had there. And then after that was, I remember my eyes been closed and a priest introducing himself to me and he praying over me with a lot of people's voices in the background. Is that scary? Yeah. Was it like you, you couldn't even, at that time, you couldn't even remember the crash or why you were there? You were no. just in the moment, what's happening? Nothing. Did you know who you are? Nope. I had no idea of anything. Um, how long from the accident to this in real time had passed? It would have been weeks. Um, I don't fully know. I, I don't have full recollection of even leaving the hospital, going home. A lot of that is a blank. Probably a blessing in another way. But pain? I don't remember. Did you a lot of pain? That is probably the biggest thing afterwards. I had a traumatic brain injury. Um, but I was so broke up, for the want of a better word. My right leg was shattered. I have a metal pin from the hip to the ankle. My left leg was fractured at the knee joint. I fractured my back, broke my neck, broke my ribs, and I had a traumatic brain injury. So my focus was on all my brakes. Mm. So I became brakes, basically, Just as a human treating being. Treating injuries and yeah, dealing with pain. It. Yeah. And when was your realization of where's my daughter? What, what's happening here? can't even answer that um i do recall at one point abby um telling me that she was upstairs but i didn't know why she was upstairs my other kids didn't i didn't know them at all 
you know, so it was more of an ordeal, I think, for them than it was for me because I hadn't got a clue. I didn't know that I was put into an induced coma because of the bleed on the brain, the injury. You know, everything was very up in the air for me. And before the accident, what was your life? What were you doing? Um, I was happy. I was living in Roscommon. I worked as a numerologist. I had my kids in school. How many kids? Three. Ages? Um, Savannah is 30. Casey is now 23. And Abby is 21. How do you have 20 something year old kids? <laughs> you, look, you look like a young one. <laughs> Sorry, can I just get you to pull the microphone just more out in front of you? Yeah, towards me, say. Yeah, okay, there. Uh, turn inside. Okay. Well, so I, yeah. yeah. Thank you. We can cut that bit out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, you don't look like someone that have that age of kids. No. And after the, when did it start coming to? When did you start realizing what had happened? Breaking everything down and understanding the situation. I went back to recuperate in my mother's. Um, everything was quite a blank because I remember lying in my mother's. One leg was up, the other was down. My arms were out like this because of the injuries to the muscles. Like I was broken everywhere. Everything was fragmented. And my mind was fragmented. I hadn't got a clue what was happening, why it happened. I was dependent on everybody else to put the pieces together. Then I had the guards come into the house for statements. I was given them my recollection of the event. And then I found out afterwards that he suffered with severe mental illness. You know, so. And the guy, he passed away. Mm -hmm. And when the guards are coming to you looking for statements, when did you, did you, did they have information for you on him straight away? Like, were they able to say to you, look, we're looking for a statement. This was the name of the guy. He suffered some mental illness. Like, when did you start realizing oh, this wasn't an accident? Um, I needed to know what was after happening. Was it a deliberate act? Um, for me, from when I started to remember the lead up to the event, um, I tried to avoid him, and it was like he followed me. Now I knew I had nowhere to go. There was nowhere for me to go bar into a wall. But in saying that, if there was a tight squeeze that you could have done three abreast, if you really wanted to, right? Yeah. I'd be a fairly good driver. I'd be fairly shrewd on the road anyway. So I knew once I swerved to avoid him and he swerved to hit me, I knew there was something more to it, right? Then I remembered nothing until I woke up. Mm. You know, and it was afterwards then that I learned that he had severe mental health issues. And that's fine. He also was a victim, mm. you know. However, in saying that, you know, your life as you know it is gone. Everything about me had changed. I didn't know why it had changed, because as far as I was concerned, I was just a broken person, broken legs, broken ribs, whatever else. The brain injury never came into play for me for months after and that was your whole life your family life upside down all your family were taking care of you someone had to take care of your kids while you weren't there yeah I had um Casey was after doing junior cert and she had done very well and Abby was with me because she was in the car with me so we were both in my parents my eldest daughter was at home with her kids um so it became very I was in my mother's, I was trying to recuperate, but in my head, I needed to go home or I was going to get sick because of my mindset. I knew I was in the greatest battle of my life and that was with my head. My head became my opponent. In what, I, in what way? If I didn't keep my mental health right, I was no good to anybody. It was going to be no good to my kids. So, so how did you I, remedy I was, that? Um, my father one day, he brought me to the GP in the wheelchair, lorried me into the car, brought me out to the GP for a painkiller. And when I came out, I said to him, there's two options here. Either I'm driving to where the crash happened or you're getting a taxi home. That's what you said. Mm. And he said his words, oh, for the curse of Jesus, Nave, <laughs> what are you doing <laughs> this to me for? 
And I said, I've got to do it or I'll never drive again. But he said, you can't look at you because it was all braced. I had a neck collar, I had broken legs. I said, just lift me into the car. It's automatic. And he said, you're not insured to drive. I said, I'll deal with that if I'm pulled. He lifted me in, got in beside me and I drove to where the crash happened. I called the man in question, every name that you can imagine. Um, he got there when you, yeah. when you were looking at Yeah. And then I said to my father, okay, you can drive home now. So I went home and um, that was on a Tuesday, I think. And on Thursday, I got up. I said to my father, put everything I have in a black bag. I'm going home. And he said, you can't. And I said, well, I'm doing it. I went home with my kids. They became my carers. I got a strategy going in my head that if I could bum up and down the stairs, keep my back straight, don't move my neck. I had a tin of peas to try and get my muscles going. So I built this strategy in my head. And it wasn't for weeks after I got up one day and I went into the bathroom. I remember holding myself up at the sink and I looked in the mirror and my words were, who the fuck are you? Because I didn't recognize myself at all. And it was then that I figured there's something wrong. Mm. But it was actually the brain injury that I hadn't even addressed. It hadn't even addressed. <clears throat> it hadn't even dawned on me. And had the doctors told you, look, you're suffering a brain injury here? Or was that something that well, you had Well, they had told my family. And my father had asked the doctor, how long is the effects of this brain injury going to last? And he said, well, Tommy, how long is a piece of string? But I still, because a brain injury is invisible, you don't see it. Mm. I just became broken legs and broken ribs. I, the brain injury never came into play. So it took months for that to come into play. And did you have nightmares about it? No, I was afraid to sleep. And I didn't <coughs> sleep because I thought that if I fell asleep, I was going to die. Because what, was my it the fear? Was it... Was it the brain injury and how close you came to death? Was that a part of it too? Or how close you and your daughter came to death? No, it was. I didn't recognize my body anymore. My feelings, my emotions, the sensations in my body, I didn't recognize them. And I didn't know that it was down to the brain injury that I couldn't recognize what was happening with my body. You, you felt disconnected from I yourself. I was completely fragmented in every way. So how did you build a strategy to get over that? The I didn't. didn't it do took, it. No, it didn't. It took me months and it wasn't till probably the November. The crash was in March and it would have been in the November when I was back hobbling again. And I had went through hell and back in them few months with my own head. Because my kids were having night terrors. They became my carers. So I would hear them at night screaming in their sleep. And I wasn't able to get to them. They were having night terrors. You know, Jeez. it was horrendous. And I remember being in the bed. I remember one night going to bed saying, I always had great faith. And I always prayed to God. And I said, if there is a mother Mary from one mother to a mother, Save my kids. And I woke the following morning and I had a sense of peace. And I, I don't know where it, it was just a sense of the pain that I had going to bed when I said that was gone overnight. I thought, somebody's after hearing me. I'm going to get through this. I must have been some sort of relief after that length of time going through all that. Yeah. But it was. I suppose the November, October, November, when the, uh, you know, it was coming up to Christmas. And in my head, I was saying, if I can just get through Christmas, I can say it happened last year. Mm. Get that the year over. Yeah, I can say it's a year gone, even though it wouldn't have been a year gone. But mm. in my head, it was a year gone. But I was still struggling with my own head. But I knew that I had to get up every day. I had to keep focused. I became the DS in my body. This was a foreign object. It was somebody that I didn't know. So every day I got up, I'd look in the mirror and say, you're going to do exactly what I tell you to do today. And if you don't, you're going to get one hell of a kick in the arse. 
And I did that every single day. So I'd get my tin of peas and I'd walk from the couch to, you know, we have the double doors in the kitchen. I'd walk. I had a name every day to walk. And I remember a few weeks after I was brought, my father brought me back to Tullamore and I went into Dr. Bear. He was, they had 12 or 14 hours of surgery to put my leg back together. because I was pretty messed up. And um, I said to him, I want crutches. And he said, you can't wait, Bear Meg. He said, you just can't. And I said, well, I'm not leaving here without crutches. I want crutches. And he said, well, look, when you come back in two weeks time, I'll consider giving you crutches. And I said, what if I bring them with me and I bring them back in two weeks time? So we had a bit of banter and mm. we were laughing and joking. He was laughing at me and he said, I'll give you the crutches once you don't use them. And of course, you used them. Yeah. <laughs> I went home. My father opened the door of the car, took out the wheelchair and I said, forget that. I'm not getting into that. So I'm not an invalid. I'm walking. And he said, you can't walk, Meg. And I said, I'm fucking walking. Took out the crutches, slipped and head first into the bonnet of my father's car. Jesus. <laughs> so I remember. Would, would you be a stubborn woman now? <laughs> uh, uh, maybe a little. So <laughs> my father was crying. My mother was crying. They were all crying. And um, ambulance was called and the paramedics arrived and they said, I said, lads, am I OK? Am I going to die? And they said. Put it this way, there's not too much more yet that's not already broke that you can break. But we're bringing you anyway. So ship me into the back of the ambulance off to Tullamore and they scanned me and said, no, you're fine. You Did know, you get an eaten off your doctor the next time you went in? He just said, you're so resilient. Uh, it's your mind has you as good as you are, you know. I suppose if you didn't have that, you wouldn't have been able to recover like you did. Yeah, so... I didn't realize that the pathways of the brain had crossed. So where I should have had chronic pain, I didn't feel it. That must have been a little blessing. In one way. In another way, it wasn't because um, the year after the crash, I kept saying to my doctor, my leg doesn't feel right. My foot doesn't feel right. And Eventually, I wrecked his head so much. He said, I'm going to send you for an MRI. And I had several fractures in the foot and I was walking on it. Now, the foot was black, of course, but... But you couldn't feel the pain, so you were just walking I, away. I, I could feel something. something. I wasn't sure what it was. I knew something was wrong. But I didn't know it was broken. <laughs> you know, so... The, a blessing in one way and a curse in another. And did your daughter suffer as bad at injuries as you or did you get the brunt of it? I took the brunt of it... Um, the way I swerved to avoid him. Now she had serious injuries too. She had dashboard injuries. She shattered her arm. You know, and still suffers terrible bad to this day. You showed me the pictures. We'll put the pictures up of the car. Mm. It's, um, I don't know how you got out of it. It's horrific. Yeah, I don't know myself, but somebody was looking after us. But it's, it's something that... Uh, is going to be ongoing for the rest of our lives. It's not something that's going to go away. Mm. You know, when you go through a trauma like that, um, you live with it every day in some way. Do you know, my body is never going to be the way it was prior to the crash. I can't do the things that I used to do. You know, I think every day, I wonder if she was here, what would she be doing? Because... I address the person that I was prior to the crash as somebody different because I am completely different. Totally different person. Very much so. Yeah. In every way. Uh, better? Um, I suppose mentally I'm way stronger. But physically I wouldn't be. You know, like... I think back of, you know, if the kids would say something funny to you and you go to run up the stairs after them and you could run two or three steps at a time and you'd be laughing and joking. There's little things that you can't do. Like I'd see people out running and out jogging and I'd say, do they know how blessed they are that they can do that? You know, it's the little things in life that we take for granted. And it's not until they're taken from us. And that we realize, well, I had all that. Did I appreciate it enough? When I could do them things. You know, now if I'm going somewhere, I have to sit down and think. Like, for example, coming down here tonight. Right. You know, if I met somebody on the road that was going to overtake the last minute, what would my reaction be? 
And what's because the, I'm you, very vigilant. Now? I'm extremely vigilant. Yeah, I'd noticed somebody slightly gone over the white line, miles up the road. I'd see it in the ditch. I'd see it in the lights. I'd be extra vigilant. But no matter how vigilant you are, if you came across another poor devil that was in that situation. You know, it's crazy. Mm. Um, and you can never prevent road traffic collisions. I mean, they're going to happen. You're going to fall off a bike or, you know, mm. th- it's just the way things are. And they can implement laws and they can bring in higher fines for drink driving. I mean, you can measure drink driving. You can measure your eyesight. How do you measure mental health? You can't. Um, a lot of people would say that the book would lie with a GP, but GPs are trained for six months out of their training in mental health. So it would have to lie with somebody. So did you, after the crash, when you recuperated, did you go down the rabbit hole of mental health issues in Ireland? Absolutely. Because even though that gentleman suffered with severe unresolved mental health il- uh, illness, He's no longer here, but that mental illness ended up in my home. And I seen the gap in the services, even with my own kids. How big are the gaps? Huge. Absolutely huge. I mean, if you break an arm in leash, you'll be seen in leash or Tullamore or any hospital, say. But if you have a mental health issue, you are seen in leash. You won't be seen in another county. Mm. Do you know, they say that there's stigma around mental health, but I wonder where the stigma is coming from because it's not the ordinary folk, right? So, for example, if you have um, a mental health issue and you're visiting somebody in Galway, and you go into a hospital and you need treatment for your mental health, If your files are in Galway or Dublin or another county, say, you have to go back to where your file is. They won't look after you. No. And that's where there's a major gap. You know, you should be seen. It doesn't matter what county you have a breakdown in or if you're suicidal, you go to a hospital, you need to be seen. I don't care where your files are. You know, that's like going into a hospital in Mullingar saying, my arm is broke. Sorry, I can't see you. You'll have to go back to Dublin. And with the guy that hit you, was it known to all his family and friends and doctors that he had serious issues? Yeah. They had plead with his mental health team. They made a plea. They begged them. They, even his brother said he'd put it in writing that if he wasn't looked after, he was going to probably take his own life, if not his and somebody else's. That's terrifying. Yeah. And I was with my daughter at the receiving end of it. That probably happens so much and we don't even know. My case was not an isolated case at all. You know, I've spoke to several people who've had similar and lost family members through the same thing. But how do you define a suicide if they don't leave a letter? You know, there's a lot of single collisions on our roads it, there is and it, it's scary like when you really look at the statistics of how many young men especially mm-hmm. are killing themselves like it's how is it not more of an issue than say covid like well, why is it like if you think worldwide how many people are dying like it's, it's really terrifying i think the suicides in ireland at the minute is the the real problem you know, but it, it's not being addressed. I mean, how do you address, in my head, and my own personal opinion, that if somebody with severe mental health problems and they're suffering psychosis and very detached from reality and they're on a downslide and they're seeing a psychiatrist, I think a psychiatrist should red flag that and say, this man is not just a threat to himself with a car but also to members of the public. I mean, when they're that far gone that they don't know what they're doing. Mm. I mean, when a child is three or four and they don't know what they're doing, you're not going to leave a loaded gun on your table, you know, in case they pick it up. Do you know what I'm saying? It is crazy. If you were to have 
an epileptic episode tomorrow yes. morning and go into a and and they were to treat you and say, look, you're, you're suffering a little bit of epilepsy. They tell you, you can't drive now. That's right. You need six months before we let you drive That's on the road. Right. Yeah. But if you're clearly psychotic mm-hmm. and you're a danger to yourself and others, mm-hmm. you can drive home. Yeah, and that's a bit of an issue. Now, and I have to clearly say, mental health falls on a very big, under a very big umbrella. And there's not one of us that's privy to not standing under it at some stage in our life. We all suffer with our mental health. If we have a good day, it's good mental health. And if we have a bad day, it's a shit mental health day. Right? Bottom line. Everybody has their own challenges and their weaknesses and their strengths. Right? You might have somebody who suffers with sensitivity. Somebody who's not good at saying how they feel inside and they'll cover it up with laughs and jokes, right? You might have somebody who abuses their freedom. Like, we all have challenges. Mm. We all suffer with our mental health. There is a huge difference between that and somebody who has severe psychosis. What is the main difference? Because we all suffer with our mental health. Mm. But somebody with psychotic who suffers with severe psychosis they haven't a clue what they're doing. They're very detached from reality. Mm. And I know they happen in episodes, but I think at the very least that their cognitive ability to drive should be assessed at more regular intervals than what they are. I believe that that gentleman that drove into me, he shouldn't have had the keys of the car. You know, That's a lethal weapon for somebody who doesn't know what they're doing. Mm. I mean, you're not going to hand a three-year-old a gun Chances are they'll shoot themselves and probably somebody else around them through no fault of their own if it's left in front of them. Yeah, it's it's, it's scary. And when me and you started messaging, mm. it kind of hit with me a little because I actually, it's only in the last six months I figured out that there's such a gap in in Ireland with mental health, mm. with the authorities and um, with the HSE because I knew someone that just, Turned into a different person, started taking these drugs, Mm -hmm. turned into an absolute different person. Scary, like scary. And they were sent to the hospital, Mm -hmm. assessed by psych nurse or psych doctor, gave more drugs, sent home, still mad as hatters. Mm -hmm. I I had to go find him one night. He went missing. Mm -hmm. And then we had to call the guards because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to handle him. Yeah. And they ended up coming out. They talked to him for a minute and they go, look, we may ring the paramedics. So the ambulance comes out. And then the guards tell me, we spend, I would say, 30 to 40 percent of our time dealing with stuff like this. And they're just sent over to the hospital. And like you said, nothing we can do. Send them home. Mm-hmm. Keys in hand. You're terrified. You don't want them with your loved ones. And that's just that's just happening everywhere. And that was when I first realized, like, wow, I can't believe this happened. I can't believe this is a, a, a thing. Very much so. And is it, it can't be just an Irish thing. No, no. But it's that, such a broad, uh, like, how, how would you think no. it would make it better? Like, what, what do you think the biggest issues are? What would help? I definitely think that without targeting mental health per se I mean that'd be very wrong I mean Mm. I love getting into my car and going for a drive I drive for hours Mm. you know if I'm having a bad day I love to get into my car and go for a drive like hundreds of other people like you said but when you're psychotic but when you have severe mental illness like that and somebody sees you in a down you know in a major decline and your doctors are aware and your psychiatrists are aware The book must stop somewhere that they say this has to end. This man or lady, whoever it is, is a threat to themselves now and a threat to the members of the public. I mean, his family, they pleaded with the mental health team. Do you know the family personally? No, I I don't. I I met them at the inquest um, and that was it. That difficult? Um, It was difficult at the time, but I knew that I had to do it. I I knew they were grieving for a loved one, you know, um, and he was deceased. And if things were right, he should be alive today. 
Um, I was also grieving for her, as I say her, the Maeve that died with him that night. Um, I was grieving for my kids to get their life back. You know, um, so there was a lot of grief around it. And it's probably the hardest part is grieving for the old self, the person you used to be. You know, um, and I suppose, you know, when I look at the statistics now, even in this country, that three in every four people that's in a severe road traffic collision, they are admitted into the National Rehabilitation Hospital with traumatic brain injuries. They're lifelong injuries. Lifelong. You know, uh, your life changes. And the brain is very complex. You know, and if there's any neurological defect, it's going to affect your function in your body. And I learned that the hard way, you know, um, between the break in my neck and the brain injury, I had to learn everything again. I didn't know when I was hungry. I didn't know what was wind. I'd wake in the middle of the night and my heart rate was through the roof. But if I vomited and stuck my fingers down my neck, the heart rate would come back to normal. So I developed little patterns that I was able to know if I do this, this will fix. And I remember if I lay on my, tried to lie on my right side, it was like every bit of fluid from the left side went to the right and vice versa. You could feel that that was the sensation That's you were was, feeling. Yeah. Oh, it was absolutely horrendous. Um, it was scary. I, I, I hadn't a clue why it was happening. And I'd have a sensation in my chest or my stomach and I'd be going, oh, Jesus, what's wrong with me? Am I dying? And I'd have to say to the girls, what's happening to me? And they'd say, ma'am, you're starving. You need to eat. And I'd write down, had this feeling it was hunger. Do you know, or a pain in my stomach. I'd have to go to the toilet. Wow. So you learn everything all over again. But I suppose if somebody had sat with me and said, you know, because of the axis brain injury that you had, so what it's like is if somebody put a paintbrush into a paint can and lapped the paint up against the wall, it splashes. So the whole brain took, you know. A belt. Yeah. And then I had a bleed as well. So my focus became my limbs, my legs. I wanted to heal. I wanted to look normal. I wanted to be normal. You know, it, this never. Came back. It, it never dawned on me. And it wasn't for. I'd say maybe 10 or 12 months later, um, the kids were crying out for some normality. And we said we'd go for dinner. And I remember it was 13 steps up into the restaurant. And I remember going, how am I going to do this? And I said, okay, we'll do it one step at a time. Um, I didn't want to tell them I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to come across as been weak. This was you telling yourself this? Yeah. I didn't want my kids to know that I was afraid because they depended on me. And my strength. And I remember getting to the top and looking down saying, okay, I got up. How the heck am I going to get back down? And I remember going in and sitting down and we ordered. And I said, this is great because we really were the only ones in the restaurant because it was early. And then it started to fill up. And then the knives and the plates and the banging and the talking. I knew there was something wrong. I thought, again, I'm dying. There's something wrong. But I wasn't. It was the brain injury because I had sensory issues and then my vision wasn't right but I didn't know it wasn't right so when for example going from the dark into a bright room um, my eyes would have to refocus so it would do you remember a television screen years ago when you're younger when they turn off RTE and it would go all fuzzy mm. that's what I would get but I didn't know was it normal I, I didn't know what was happening to me I didn't know it was down to the brain injury and did your personality change after it? Like types of music, uh, movies, did you watch the soaps? Like what was the main differences that other people noticed? I know you probably didn't notice, but uh, with your My family... kids would often say, we really miss mommy. And I used to say, <sighs> I miss her too. That's the only thing I could say. I miss her terribly. Because I did miss her. And to this day, I think about her a lot. Because it's like I'm thinking of a completely different human being. I'm so different. 
So you're when you sit back and think about that, you it's like two duly different people. Yeah. In every way. In every way. How I think how I process things. My brain is completely different. Do you, I'm not saying you wouldn't want the crash to happen. I'm, I'm just saying, are you a better person mentally now? Or were you better before? I don't know. I suppose there's elements of her here. Um, I'm more practical of an approach. Before the crash, I would have been more... Um, how would you put it? I'd be this sobby, sobby person. I'd be full of empathy and compassion and everything was seen through empathy and compassion. And now I'm not. I've I've no tolerance for bullshit. None. You know, I set a goal and I'll do it. You know, I think life is so short uh, and it is. It can change in the blink of an eye, as I know. So... I suppose how I focused after the crash was I thought that if I can save just one person or one family from going through what we did, then so be it. I'll die a happy woman. So tell us all, all the things that you do now. Um, well, I suppose I got a campaign going, um, my own campaign, um, to try and get legislation brought in. Um, Elber Toomey was a lady down in Cork. I don't know whether you remember Elber. Elber went on holidays to Wales with her family, um, her husband and her child, and she was pregnant at the time. And uh, they were in a road collision as well, where a car swerved onto their side of the road. Uh, she lost her child. Um, she lost her husband and her unborn baby. Um, she set up a campaign as well, even though her collision happened in the UK. It's not an iso- mine isn't an isolated case in this country. I know several cases similar to my own and similar Ever. to Albert. Yeah, you, you yourself know yeah. several. Yeah, I've spoke to several families. That's um, not good. And they've asked me to continue doing what I'm doing. I suppose I set out to do it to keep my mental focus. Um, because I look at my kids today and I think. I tried to turn something very negative into a positive in some way. Like um, my daughter that came on the crash went on to do nursing and she wanted to do psychiatric nursing. Did she come on the crash after you? Yeah, I was going to pick her up and I had rang her as I was leaving the driveway of the house. And I said, I'll be there in 10 minutes. Don't come out the door of the cinema until you see me falling up. So she knew I was on the way when I didn't turn up and she was ringing my phone. My phone was going, you know, that stupid sound, boo, lolly, you know, when the, mm. it's out of zinc, it was doing that. She heard all the sirens and she asked um, a woman for a lift home. The road was corned off and um, she got out of the car. She went through the barrier and I was in the car. The other gentleman was deceased in his car. Jesus Christ. And Abby was nowhere to be seen. Um, Abby that was with me in the car, um, a um, young man from Roscommon helped her out of the car, her side. Um, and they did what they could with her to keep her right. So it was kind of very much a family ordeal in a way. But I think it's something they're going to bring with them for the rest of their lives. Do you know, that they'll never forget whether it be what they saw or, or the smell even of burning rubber. And like Maybe a blessing in one way that I don't have any recollection of that. Absolutely. You know, or do you think sometimes you'd like to have recollection of it? No, I do. Listen, only the other night my own daughter brought it to my attention what she saw that night. And it was very, very difficult when she described when she said um, when she was crying the other night when she brought it up. And she said, Mom, you were lying over the steering wheel. Your eyes were wide open. The lights were on, but you were dead. And I said, but I'm here now. And she said, I know, but that that image is in my head forever. You know, and for me, I I think then this could have been prevented. Why did somebody not listen to the family's pleas? Why had he the keys of the car? Now, granted, you want to get a car and you want to take keys. 
you're going to do it. But at least have some measure in place that it may be prevented. Right. I know at the minute that the Road Safety Authority are working in conjunction with um, uh, the college in Dublin, Trinity College, and also the Rehabilitation Centre, the hospital in Dublin, um, to try and reduce road traffic collisions by half, by 50% by 2030. Um, by implementing different legislations like bringing up road fines and making sure that drink driving is addressed and all of that. And that's great. And I compliment them for doing that. And I hope it works out. I haven't heard anything about mental health though. And it should be addressed. Why do you think is it such a huge problem in so many aspects of it they don't want to? I think a lot of people are afraid to address it. But... You know, I got an opportunity going back um, at the beginning of the year where Elber had sent me a link to the Road Safety Authority where they were um, doing a reboot on licensing. And I, I said, you know what, I'm going to apply for it and see what happens. So I did. I sent away my form online through email to the European Commission and uh, was accepted. And I got a link and they invited me to address the European Commission. And of course, I gung ho, I said, I don't care what organ... It said, what organization are you involved with? What, whatever. I went, I'm a lone ranger. Like I literally answered it, you know, as if I was chatting to you. I'm a lone ranger. This is what happened to me. I want to address it. And when I seen then that they agreed um, and got the invitation over, I said, I want to talk at this. How am I going to do this? So I contacted the European Federation for Crash Victims. And I said, any chance I get to speak at this, would you give me some of your talk time? And they agreed. That was cool. So I kind of went in with, I didn't go in as if they were any different than anybody else. No I nerves. Said, I just didn't care. <laughs> I just said, look, lads, this is the way it is. How you all, you know, this is the way it is. And this is what happened to me. And this was my, these were my injuries. And which he does the book lie with, by the way, where legislation comes in. You know. Anyone yeah. popped their hand? Would you believe the lights were going off in the corner, all the green lights were, and you could see where they were writing up, uh, we agree with Maeve, we agree with Maeve. And I went, you can see yeah. that. You can see it, yeah, it comes up on the screen. And I was delighted um, and because I said, you know, the book lies with some of you. I want you to look at this as if it was a member of your family. Could have been your brother, could be your sister, could, you know, look at it that way. What would you like to put in place to protect a member of your family? And I got to say what I set out to say. And I was delighted and I left it at that. And in the meantime, I've written a book. Um, it's a memoir, you know, my life since the crash. And I've spoke to the European Federation for Crash Victims and tasked them would they, you know, because they did say they'd back me in whatever I needed to do. But I feel that mental health, there is such stigma around mental health. And they shouldn't because it's an everyday thing with everybody. There shouldn't be any stigma around it. No, you know, no, there shouldn't. And we're very quick to judge. At like, you don't know what other people are going through. You really don't. You know, I, I only recently I seen a thing on. I don't know whether you've ever seen it. It's called Tattle, where they slate um, people on slo social media. I don't watch any of that stuff. <laughs> but, I just post and ghost. <laughs> but you know what I, I think it's wrong is <clears throat> just because you come across as been out there on social media doesn't mean you're in a good place in your head. This could be a, a, a place to let go. And then you'll have some asshole who decides, well, I'll put you back in your box. Well, it is what it is. Oh, it is what you know, it is. No, if you, you don't belong finding out when you do social media that if you if you buy into the, the endless vices of strangers yes you, you really should back away from them yeah you know but that's more common sense when it comes to it's like when you're talking about mental issues mm -hmm. it's not a policing issue you know that's nothing the guards can do anything about i know but here's the sad thing that three in every four people that's in a road traffic collision, end up in the rehabilitation hospital in Dublin, right, with a brain injury. Most of these catastrophic injuries, the guards are there to witness that carnage. 
Mm. That affects their mental health. Of course. Do. The paramedics that go out, whether it's a death or catastrophic um, injuries, it affects their mental health. So it's a ricochet, no matter how you look at it. Right? And what happened to me affected my kids. It affected my family, my extended family. It affects everybody, not just one person. You know, and I think mental health needs a serious revamp. I mean, at the minute in our country, I believe in live and let live. I don't care if they're brought in every country and then they all come in on sailboats. But make sure that you have the resources to deal with it. We don't have enough Gardaí in this country with the amount of people that's in it at the minute. We don't have enough paramedics. You know, there's not enough. You know, I, Nobody realises that until they need one. And that's the problem. Until it's too late. But then they'll point the finger at a paramedic or the guards. Oh, you're at fault. But they're not. You know, if there's not enough resources, there's not enough paramedics out there. You know, when they say they are the National Ambulance Service, they are. Just because they're stationed out of Athlone or Tullamore or Galway doesn't mean they're not going to end up in Cork tonight. Which mm. shouldn't be the way. And you did went down the road of mental health. Yeah. What do you think the biggest effect is on people's mental health now in the age we live in? Why do you think there's so much issues? If I was to be very honest, I mm. think it's very easy brand somebody with something. I think antidepressants and all of these things are been thrown out nilly willy. You know, and they shouldn't be. Mm. You know, everything is branded now. Or oh, you have such a thing. Or oh, you have this and you have that. How can you tell somebody that they have something unless you sit with them and you know them? You know, there has to be a long history. You know, it's not just I'm having a bad day. Oh, here's an antidepressant. Yeah. And when you think about it logically, everyone's so different. Everybody. And mentally, everyone has a different life. Absolutely. Like it, it's so intricate. But Absolutely. still, this one drug suits everything. Yeah. Like it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And it shouldn't work like that. Um, because I've seen it with my own kids since the crash. They've suffered greatly with their mental health and have done. Um, I can't fix it. As a mother, what's the first thing you want to do is make them feel better. Mm. You depend solely on a doctor, a psychiatrist. They don't always look into the background of somebody to see what suits them. Not every um, antidepressant suits an individual. It can make their suicidal thoughts worse initially. That should be highlighted. You know, that for the first month or six weeks that you're on this, this could make you a lot worse than what you are. You know, and I've went down that road and I've seen it firsthand, you know, where you'd want to go in and get a doctor and put him up against the wall and say, Really? Oh, you should be a dead man. You know, and that's a mother's natural reaction, you know, when it comes to wanting to protect one of your kids. You want um, to save Would you have life. noticed that because you've been down that road? Yes. If a normal mother would just say, just trust the doctor. Yeah. Yeah. I question everything. Everything. I take nothing at face value. But that's just me. And I suppose that's because I've had to learn everything all over again. You know, I had to learn the function of the body, how it worked, what was wrong with me. Yeah, I had nobody to tell me what was wrong. You know, I ended up doing my own investigations into the human body <laughs> as much as I could. Um, I remember because of the brain injury, I started to research um, uh, Dr. Corinne Allen in the States. Um, she's a neuro uh, neurologist, a doctor mm. in neurology. And I started doing all my neurological checks every day to well, make what's sure. What's a neurological check? To see if the brain is functioning the way it should, you know, that my coordination was right. I'd lie in the bed and I'd run one heel up one leg and the other up the other. I'd be doing the nose to the point, this kind of thing, and walk in a straight line to try and get my brain function back again because I had terrible balance issues but and that was because of digestive issues 
because the vagus nerve that runs from the brainstem, that is the wandering nerve and that controls the whole body. And if there's any disruption to that nerve, you know about it. So I was like a bit of a time bomb, you know, with my nervous system. You know, it was misfiring all the time. I had no idea why. So I had to do my own research. So through it, you know, because of the vagus nerve and the disruption and the pathway, you know, if I didn't eat every two hours, I had no balance. If I hadn't, uh, you know, if I had indigestion, I had no balance. So I had to find the balance between eating, not allowing myself to get windy. Um, if I drank a glass of orange, I'd have no balance. You know, I'd be holding on to the chair praying that I belch so huh. that I get my balance back. Do you know, little things. So I had to educate myself for the last six years too, which shouldn't have been the case. You know, to me, all of this might have been avoidable if our mental health system. So where are you now on everything? Where am I at the minute? Um, still looking after my home, my kids. Um, in hope that they will bring in some kind of legislation around mental health. What would you like them to bring in? I if, would like... Would there be one legislation you think would help a lot? What would it be? I think somebody with a chronic mental illness who suffers daily with severe acute psychosis, that there should be a legislation. No more than... It, Look, if you go to the pub and you have one pint, they say that your cognitive ability is impaired, mm. right? And there's a legislation there. But you can measure alcohol. Yeah. I think that if um, a psychiatrist is well aware of a patient and sees that there's a massive decline in somebody's mental health, that I think they have a moral responsibility to contact the guards. But the guards can do feck all unless there's some kind of legislation to back it. And I think it's down to traffic medicine here in Ireland. I think it's down to the Road Safety Authority and the European Commission to look at it and bring in some sort of legislation to protect road users and also those with mental health illness. Not, yeah, not just road users, people living in a home with someone like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. I mean... I know that if one of my kids or a family member were in a massive decline with their cognitive um, ability to do anything, I would do everything I could to protect them. You know, if I thought, I mean, if, if you think somebody is suicidal in your home, what are you going to do to protect them? You'd be watching your knives, you'd be watching, you know, you discard of things that might make it easy. Just a horrible thought, isn't it? It's a horrible thought, but it's fact. You're going to do everything you can to protect your own. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I, I, like, I know it's horrible, but these are facts. You want to protect your loved ones. Do you know, a, a car is one of the biggest tools you can ever have. It's a time bomb for somebody with severe mental illness. Mm. You know, and not alone that, and I often think after... I know that my daughter was in the car with me and she has suffered so bad um, mentally and physically since the crash. And she's still only 21 and she's in college. And, you know, she's she's a great kid to do what she has done to date uh, while having all that going on in her head. I know that, like, for example, this year was my first, uh, probably the hardest year since the crash where I had to really focus my brain, if you want to put it that way. I um, got involved with um, the defibrillator group in Athlone. I said that if I can save one life and be there because of COVID and, you know, the resource and the ambulance service and everything, that if somebody needed a defibrillator, that if I could um, be part of that, that if I could be on scene within three or four minutes of somebody having a cardiac arrest and save their life, that it'd be well worth it. Mm. Right? Because I know that time is essence. And... Um, I decided then to uh, go on and do a course with medical ambulance. Um, and I did that and I started off. I had five days left to do 
and I stepped back uh, three weeks ago and we were in class and we were due to go out over Christmas on our placements with the ambulance. You know, mm. Delighted to get as far as I did. Um, and in the class, we covered brain injury and open femur fractures and main arteries and bleeds and death and all of that. We recovered nearly every aspect that I had. And it was showing the brain and the bleed on the brain. And I don't know what happened that day, but I remember just looking thinking, I can't do this. Really? Uh, I can't do this. My head was. It, it's probably the first time in years that I've had to brain overload. Right. So I was doing so much, writing my book, doing the thing with the ambulance. Is the book written now? Yeah, I'm still st- Doing a few finishing touches. Hopefully I'll have it out in March or April. It was to be out gone by, but I said I'd wait till I was finished with medical doing my EMT. But I had five days left anyway, and I rang them in medical and I said, Look, here I'm gonna be honest, I've had a meltdown. I just can't do this. I said it was too hard. I was sitting in the class and for every injury that came up on the board. Oh, I had that. And I just found it really, I got a brain overload. And I was waking in the middle of the night shouting, epiglottis. I was shouting all these <laughs> medical terms. And I was jumping out the bed like a ninja in the middle of the night. And I was sweating and I was seeing people dying. And I was at road crashes and I was thinking, how would I save their life? What am I going to do? My brain was just in overdrive all the time. So I just said, I have to step back from everything a minute, you know, step back from the defibrillator group, step back from everything medical. Since it happened, are you just trying to do too much? Probably. Do you relax? Not really. Are you happy? I'm happy, yeah. I'm always pretty happy-go-lucky. Do you know what I mean? I, you know, I love to see people happy. I love to see people succeed. You know, um, I'm probably very much a mother figure to everybody. I'd like to be help everybody, you know, from the youngest to the oldest. I don't care. You know, where do you find your most joy now? Um, I love my downtime. I love my own space. I love my dog. You know, you know, I just it's little things. I love the simple things in life. You know, I don't need to be out there. I have a routine. Um, I have one really good friend. She's very good to me. We'll be in contact every day. If I don't contact her, we call each other Winnie One and Winnie Two, <laughs> right? And um, she'll ring me and she'll say, all right, Winnie, what's going on today? Didn't hear from you yesterday. You know, first the head today. Uh, vice versa. You know, we have a good old friendship. Um I suppose my main focus is keeping my kids right. How are they? Um, they're doing okay. Um, they have their good days and bad days. You know, it's been a pretty shit week for all of us this week. I don't know what it is with the week we had, but we were all struggling. There's something week. in the air. There was definitely something in the <laughs> air this week. I don't know what it was. It was kind of like, oh shit, can't go through this this week. This is just crap. You know, and you'd be pulling at straws or you'd be saying, what can I do? And I wouldn't mind. I got an award last week for the um, for the great garden that I have. Because I love great my garden? Day. Yeah. You like gardening? I love my garden. Um, I do. I hate fecking spiders, but I love my garden. I, well, I hate spiders and I hate gardens. Hate, and you're out in the woods <laughs> like, and you hate spiders. I hate spiders. <laughs> and I'm the same. I dread them. But um, Do you live in the country? No, I live in the town. I did live in the country and I moved back in. Um, I had no choice but to move back in because I couldn't get my kids into the car. They didn't want to be in a car. Have they a phobia of cars now? Um, well, they do in a way. Um, Abby, that was with me in the car, she actually went to Dublin there a couple of weeks ago um, with her boyfriend and he got a new car and they went up to a match. And on the way back, um, they took a wrong turn. And they ended up coming back an old, the old Mullingar Road. And when she got into the house, I just looked at her and I went, what happened? What's wrong? What's wrong? She couldn't breathe. I said, what happened? And I said, 
you're on a bad road. And she said, yeah. yeah. That's and I got it. And she just said, oh, there was a lunatic behind us. And and that's just something that you have to live with. You just have. Mm. Like, there's, it's not optional. You know, you just have to get on with it. You know, I mean, there's loads of things I can't do, but there's loads of things I can do. Mm. And what I do, I do it with passion. I love people. You know, I don't care who they are, what they are, what they have, what education they have. I just love people. You know, I get on fairly well with everybody. If I like you, you know I like you. And if I don't like you, you fucking know I don't like you. You know, I am very... After you come that close to death, it has to change. Like you said, no time for bullshit anymore. Or you have no time for... You you live life, yeah. and you want to help people. Yeah. But do you ever do you have a different perception of death? No, I was always pretty intuitive as a kid. Um, a very intuitive grown up. I always had great faith. Um, I still have great faith. Um. I worked as a numerologist. I love numerology. And um, I think faith for me is a great marriage between your thought and your emotion. Yeah, and yeah, that's a good one. That you have to feel in your heart. Your heart is the only place that there's no ego. There's ego in your thoughts and there's ego in your emotions. There's no ego in your heart. And if you can find happiness in your thought and your emotion but only through love you'll have a positive outcome um and i think when you wake every morning i none of us have a future yet as you know we create mm. our future mm. but most people when they wake in the morning they'll have a thought of something that has happened in the past and with that thought they bring an emotion so if it's not a happy thought or a good thought they bring a bad emotion with it That'll determine whether they're going to have a good day or a shit day. Yeah. Right. So for me, it was to try and have that marriage as much as I could um, to have a happy thought. Now, it doesn't happen all the time for humans. Mm. It just doesn't work that way. But um, I suppose I am conscious that uh, we all have different challenges. We all have strengths. We all have weaknesses. It doesn't make us any better or any less than any other human being you know if we were if we didn't have challenges we wouldn't be here no. if we had nothing to learn we wouldn't be here and i think we all learn from each other and i think we all chronically underestimate how we should just live in the moment just a little bit yeah you know just not to think about the past not think about the future just have these little moments yeah i, I think me personally my belief, I think we're all born very powerful and we're all born with a God energy inside us. And it's up to us as human beings to connect with that energy in us. You know, as, you know, as the saying goes, those who go within awaken and those who look outside dream. Mm. You know, and it's sad that sometimes you have to die to come alive. Yeah. Uh, What's that saying? French Pascal, wasn't it? Mm. Um, uh, every man has two lives mm. and his real one only begins when he realizes he has one yeah. so sometimes you have to die to come alive um, and I suppose after the crash uh, my faith was probably what saved me really you know mm. I really believe that and did you just have a constant were you constantly dialoguing with God, or like, what way did you handle that? Because it could go either way. You know, a lot of people, when an accident happens, they can get very nihilistic and think, "Why, why did this happen to me?" I suppose acknowledging that <clears throat> um, this was my greatest opponent, and I was in the greatest battle of my entire life, and it was with this. I didn't recognize this. The only thing that I could control was this um while also been aware that you know you can go on a very slippery slope very quickly 
you know, you can't stay positive all the time. We're always going to have bad days. You know, but I knew that if I didn't try and take control of it, I was going to be destroyed. I had to stay somewhat normal for my kids. Uh, and I still feel that way today. You know, that no matter how I'm feeling or what I'm thinking, I still have to stay somewhat, mm. you know, right, should I say. Do you no. know what I mean? I would say... And I think probably the best way that I did handle it was, I used to say, negative thoughts are not from God. And that's how I dealt yeah. with it. So if I had a negative thought, I'd say, it's not from God, so I'm not listening to it. So I'd think a positive thought. And I'd say, Thanks God, I'll get through it, you know. And that's how I dealt with it. You know. If you could achieve anything in the next five to ten years, what would it be? To see... Um, a legislation coming in to protect those who suffer with mental health because it doesn't matter. Every life matters. You know, and the gentleman that drove into me should be here today. It wasn't for the want of his family begging for help from the mental health team. And it wasn't adhered to. I mean, his brother even said that he would put it in writing that he would take his life, if not his, and somebody else's. And nobody listened. You know, that man should be here today. You know, he was very much a victim. You know, and if our mental health was revamped in this country, and it should be revamped across the board, um, half, hats off to Niall Breslin. Bresley, you know, he wants mental health taught in the schools. Because, I mean... You don't know what goes on at home. You know, a child could be in school, have a bad day at home or whatever, and can be bullied in school. I mean, education starts at home. You expect the school to continue that education. You know, like every child is different. Mm. We're all different. Even a child that, you know, suffers with sensitivity and they might be shy. You could have a child that's very analytical and prefers to sit in a corner with a book. Doesn't mm. mean they're depressed. I have three of them. I don't, they're also different. I don't know where they came out of. <laughs> yeah. And there you go, like different personalities. But uh, for example, if you have a child that l- is quite analytical and they're very left-brained and they like to go in and sit with a book in a corner and they're not really great with mixing and they probably don't want to mix, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them. Mm. It could be just their makeup. But uh, we're living in a society where... Uh, you know, people are branded. We're living in a society where we're all built to conform to be little cogs in the machine. You know, you know, take in this information. If you don't take it in the sequence we're giving you, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. And it's it's great at pumping out little workers, right? But not everyone's suited to be that little worker, and they just get left behind. Yeah. You know, even we were talking about it the other night when. I was younger. I was going out every weekend and just because everyone else did. I didn't want to. I didn't like it. I didn't enjoy it. But everyone else is and you think you're going to miss something. So imagine I was indoctrinated to, like many other people, what do you do on a Saturday night? Like if you stay in with mom and dad, what are you? So you're some sort of loser. Like. <laughs> you're you're, you're, you're going to be alone. You're going to die alone. Buy a few cats. So it's like, there's just... There's there's one road we're all supposed to go down. I think it's changing a little because, you know, social media has its negatives and internet and, and, and YouTube. But there's just so much information out there. So everyone, we never had information when we were young. We, we knew what we were told. Whatever the encyclopedia said, and whatever the TV, the four or five channels said, we believed it. You see it on the news, you believe it. You're taught it in school, you believe it. Now we just have this influx of information. There's too much. First time in human history. Too much information. You just have to learn where the rubbish is and where it isn't. And the only way that you can do that is learn to critically think about stuff. So really what we should all be doing is not just thinking about it. But how, do you, how do you know what path to take? It's like I was at a wedding last night and I was talking to a nephew. And he was there, oh, I don't know what to do when I get older. He's 15 or 16. You know, what am I supposed to do? What, I'm in transition here. What should I do? And I'm there, imagine. Like, just do stuff. 
you know, we should be teaching, do, do loads and stuff. You figure it. But no, no, this is a pick, pick a course. Yeah. And then um, you're wondering why everyone's so... Yeah. You know, it's pick so something confused. and it's not something they end up doing in the end. Yeah, because who does? Some of the greatest achievers in the world weren't educated. Mm. Try and take oh. his pig, Shay. But you're not. And I'm not starving. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You're not. Though. <laughs> well, you I'm know? not. In, in some ways, I'm not. In some ways, I'm not. No, I didn't finish school. I left school in fourth year. You know, I wasn't one that was. I had friends, but I was very. I did my own thing. Didn't know where I fit in in society. You know, when you just don't know. Mm. I was very intuitive. Did you come from a big family? No, my um, I had a brother and a sister. My brother died when I was 18. He was 20. And he died in a drowning accident. Jeez, that must have been traumatic. It was. And you know, the funny thing about it is um, with the brain injury since the crash, I don't remember a lot of things. Things come back in like flashes, you know, like I'll remember every feckin' trauma that happened. But I won't remember other things, you know, like I was on Facebook recently and I wouldn't be using it that often. I'm not a lover of Facebook, but um, a girl I know posted a picture of our year in school. I was going, I was in her class. And I kept looking through the pictures and I was like, that's me. Because the rest of them, like. Couldn't remember any of them. No. And it bothered me. And I remember saying to my GP, what's going on with me? How is that I don't know any of them? And he said, well, there's nothing wrong with me and I can't tell you half I went, you know. And he always make me feel like that it's okay. But I'd go home and I would dissect it and I would not leave it alone until I could at least find five or six that I knew. But I'd keep doing it. You know, I'd pull things apart. Like, I'd be pretty hard on myself as well, you know. Um, but little things like that. Like, I can remember everything about Ken's death. Everything. Detail for detail. But uh, if you ask me something... Were you close to him? Very. Uh, he was the only boy in the house. I, w- I was the last one to see him out of the family that night. So it was very difficult. And I, I suppose my father worked for Shan Navigation. So he was the head boatsman. Um, and that night, my parents went to their friend's house. My mother was a hairdresser and she went to do Joan's hair. And I remember sitting on the couch with my bottle of Coke and six pack of potatoes and loads of rubbish and watching MTV at the time. And what uh, age were you? I was 18. And I was only after coming out of hospital. I had a cyst and I had it removed. And that pr- he had come into the hospital the previous day after I came out from surgery and I kept saying, please don't make me laugh. Please don't make me laugh. He was a real comedian, you know. And um, anyway, long story short, uh, my parents came in. I was sitting on the couch and my father said, she has a flashlight. The guards are outside. He said, I'm going to have to go. He said, somebody's in difficulty. because My father was on the rescue service. Mm. So he'd have to get into the boat. And it wouldn't have been unusual for him to go up the Shannon and come back with two or three bodies, you yeah. know. And that was his job and, you know, he was used to it. But he came back in. I remember standing in the sitting room and he came back in and he picked up the sweeping brush and he was sweeping. And my mother kept saying, Tommy, what's wrong? You know, what's wrong? And he dropped the brush and he went out to the hall and he picked up the phone and just heard him saying, uh, this is Tommy Kelly here in Atlone. He said, would you mind getting a message to my brother to tell him my son was drowned tonight in the Shannon? I remember getting up saying, What? I, I, that was all he said. I remember going out. I was all stitches because I had a surgery. I got into the car and I drove down to the Shannon. And when I got there, the fire service was there and the guards. And I kept shouting at them, you're looking in the wrong place. You're in the wrong place. And because I was, we were reared on the Shannon because that was daddy's job. And um, I said, look at the current. He's long gone. He's down the Shannon. You're in the wrong area. And I remember shouting at them. And I remember the guard coming over saying, you know, there's nothing you can do. You have to go home. And the guards brought me back to the house. And I went in. And it was just very surreal because he was body was missing for 10 days. How did they know he was dead then, that night? Uh, yeah, sure, the water was way up. Like, there was no way he could have got out of it. He did swim down to where my father's uh, boat was on the docks. Um, that was his boat for his job. Shannon Navigation was a cruiser that he used for 
run up and down the Shannon. He did get as far as there and tried to get out, but the current took him. And um, I remember for the 10 days that he was missing, um, the chopper from Val Donald was down and I went every day to the Shannon, as you do. And you're praying that they'll find him. And um, my father would have been able to find him, but they wouldn't give him permission to look. As he knew the Shannon inside out and upside down. That was his job. He surveyed it. And um, I remember going to the barracks with him then over to Mick Tomas. And he said, I'm looking for permission from head office to find my son. And they gave him permission. And I went with him. And I remember him saying to the divers, he said, my son is down there. That would tell them where to go. And um, I remember going home saying, right, they're bound to find him. And I was passing the Royal Hotel in Athlone in the car and the 12 o'clock bells for the news came on. And it said, body of Athlone boy, Ken Kelly, has just been discovered. Before you knew? Before I knew. And I remember putting the boot to the floor, uh, going through the town and down. And just as I drove down to the water, they were bringing his body in in the boat. Um, my uncle was with them um, in the boat. And I remember thinking, Jesus Christ, is it him? And I kept asking them, could I have a look to see, was it him? As you talk about people being cruel and mental health, um, we had that many phone calls that week, that 10 days that he was missing. And Ken was a drummer. Um, he played with um, Connie Lee and the Cruisers and he was after tour in the UK. And um, he, our neighbours was the show band show, Keith and Lorraine MacDonald. And we all hung around as kids. You know, we were all great friends. We were next door neighbours. So and Frankie played with Joe Dolan. So we were very much into the music, you know. And um, Peter and Keith and Lorraine, they were away that weekend. I think they were in the UK and uh, they came back. But it was a whole 10 days of him missing. And then we had the whole ordeal of the funeral and everything like that. So it was pretty. But every detail of that I can remember to this day. But if you ask me. Because maybe that's a horrific story. Yeah, sure, look. <laughs> That that's really sad. That is sad. He was the only boy, you know, as well in the house, the only son, you know, and he was a fantastic swimmer. Um, he was great, great drummer. You know, it was just unfortunate. Jesus, you know. you've been through a lot. Yeah, I think we all go through traumas in our lives, don't we? I mean, I haven't been through any of that. That's that's tough. You know, that, ta that takes a lot of um. Mental strength. That does, but you know what? I think at the end of the day, you have to be there for each other as a family. You know, I had a younger sister. Judy is 40 now. And um, she's a kid of her own. So you kind of look out for each other. You know, life is short. You know, and Some people have it a little bit easier than others. But I think the main thing is you don't let life change you. You have to... You make the most of it. You know, there's learning in everything, mm. you know, and you have to take that with everything. That what did you learn from it? What has it taught me? It'll either teach you what you don't want to be or something that you want to be. And you have to really take it like that. Yeah, the mindset's important. Very important. And that's why I think that mental health should be a huge thing. It really should be first and foremost. Because if you don't have that, you know, the brain is a very complex thing. And it controls everything in our body. You know, it sends signals everywhere. If the brain is messed up, that's it. And I think there should be so much more emphasis put on mental health than anything else. I mean, you're not going to be turned away from a hospital with a broken leg or a broken bone. But you can be turned away from a hospital with your mental health. You know, and I think it's very wrong. You know, that needs to change. But I think so many people are afraid to discuss it. And that's why, and again, I have to say hats off to Niall Breslin. You know, and he went by his own mental health as a young person. And I followed his strategies, even his breathing exercises. And, you know, and he um, always says that sometimes the best thing that you can do is tell somebody to fuck off. And he's 100 percent right. You know. You have to learn to be able to know your boundaries, set boundaries. And if you're having a bad day, you need to be able to tell people to back off. And sometimes saying back off is not enough. 
I went to come to Vicky now and she started giving me shit. <laughs> I said, <laughs> Maeve told me to tell you to fuck <laughs> off. <laughs> you know, I, but it is true. I know when he brought out the T-shirt and I read it, I went, I wonder how the media is going to take to that. They're going to swallow him up. But they didn't. You know, because sometimes you have to be kind to yourself. You know, you really do. You have to look after yourself. If you can't look after yourself, how do you look after others? You know. Do you not think it's the fact that we live in a world now where we're all supposed to just lie? We're supposed to just go with the flow. Don't yeah. say you don't agree with something. You know, the intelligent people are being silent, so the stupid don't get offended. And yeah, we I all tie that line, toe that line. Yeah, I think it's wrong because, you know, if I think somebody is beautiful, I'll tell them. You know, I don't care if they're married or single. I think you shouldn't have to hide whether somebody is good looking or they're not. There's loads of beautiful people in the world. If somebody is beautiful, tell them. If you like something about them, tell them you like them. That whether it's a nice jumper, a nice pair of shoes. You know, what is the issue in complimenting somebody? It doesn't mean you want to run away with them. You know, it, you should be able to do these things freely. You know, I, I think there's so much stigma around so many things. But if your life is nearly taken short and you realize that the stuff that people complain about, you know, is wrong. It's it's crazy. Like, mm. you know, when you're in your deathbed, you look back over your life and say, imagine I used to worry about eating a bun. Or I used to worry about eating an ice cream. And to this day, I say that, I'm saying that for other people, that I have a very strict diet, but it's because I have to have one. Because if I have too much busy, or should I say acid in my body, I don't have balance. Which is, I don't know what's strange. I love acid in my body, but not that type. <laughs> I bought um, I bought a Kangen machine after the crash. Oh, yeah. It's, um, now, and sure there's loads of people out there that say that's rubbish, that's shite, that doesn't work. But I can tell you it does work. It's a Kangen water machine. It's a medical device in Japan, right? So it changes the pH of the water. With light. Right. No, there's plates in the machine that cleanses the water and it changes the pH balance. Right. So. I bought one of them after watching Dr. Corinne Allen. who She's a neurologist in the States who treats all her brain injury patients with Kangen water. Right. So I said, look, I'm going to give it a lash and see will it work. So I bought one. They're four and a half thousand, but it was probably the best. Jesus. Four and a half thousand that I ever spent in my life. Does it taste any different? Once you start drinking it, you can't drink tap water or bottled water, believe it or not. <laughs> right? That's it there. It goes everywhere with me. Right? I fill it before I leave the house and I bring it with me. And I, I, this is why I love doing podcasts. <laughs> right? Because this is new to me. Yes. Hanging water. Hanging water. So it's alkaline water. So I said, if I can alkaline my body, and take all the unnecessary gases. Now, and we all need gas in our body to break down our food. Right, mm. we do. But if I have excess gas, I like banana chip. Right. But changing the pH would be taking down the acidity. That's right, yeah. Yeah, it takes down the acidity in your body, which is what I wanted to do. Right, because after the crash, you can imagine the lactic acid in my body with my muscles. So the brain is 80% water. After having a brain injury, how do you do when you feed your brain what it needs? So for me, it was three litres of water every day and um, proper, as I say, proper water. Now, other people would say that's shite, but that's it's That's my not. week's fuck now, listening to the audiobooks <laughs> and podcasts about Kangen water. <laughs> no, it does work. It absolutely, it does work. It does work. Um, that's mad. I had another friend, um, Declan Dorr. Declan had a brain injury as well. He was in a, he was knocked down and had a brain injury. And like that, he started with the Kangen water. It's excellent. Like the 2.5, um, it's very acidic water. It's great for, you know, you can brush your teeth with it, whitens your teeth. Um, there's loads of stuff. Can you buy Kangen water without the machine? Or do you have to have the machine? No, you have to have the machine. Now, people do sell it, but it's right. I do give it to people. Whoever wants it, I give it to them. You know, it's only water at the end of the day, but it is alkaline. That's cool. Know? 
anyone's listening here that sells Kangen water machines, I'll take one. <laughs> but look, all I can say is it worked for me for exactly what I needed it to do. And I can only say what I did for me. And it did work for me. You know, that if I had too much acid and I had no balance, if I drank two litres of that, the 9.5, it reduced the acid in my it's stomach. Cool. And it did work. Um, and any strategies I came up with to try and get the brain function again, you know, because you're either left brain, right brain, and any of the, um, on a neurological side, that if there's any dysfunction in the brain, it affects the human body, as you know. And that's why my hearing and my vision, and you know, there was often times I'd want a glass of water and I'd say, well, you get me a tap, but I would mean, yeah. can I get a glass of water? So I had to try and train the brain again. It's like, it was said to me that it's almost like if you have to go to Dublin every day on the same road to work and you're doing that same road for 40 years to get to your job for nine o'clock and then one day you get up and the road is closed. You have to find the quickest route to get to your job for nine o'clock in the morning. Well, the brain does the same thing mm. when the pathways have been crossed. So I had to try and find the quickest way to get the brain to work again. And if that meant drinking alkaline water, yeah, how are we going to do it? it? Of course. You know, so I started drinking broccoli sprout twice a day, um, beetroot juice. Um, I really went into feeding my body what I thought it needed. Well, it obviously worked. It, you know, you, you don't seem to have any cognitive problems having the chat with you here. And you look great. <laughs> so you must be doing something, right? <laughs> cognitive problems. <laughs> well, you know what? I... D- if I get very tired or very overwhelmed, I still, my emotions and feelings don't work the way, you know, yours might or somebody else might. You well, know my what emotions I mean? are all over the place at this <laughs> time. <laughs> this has been a weird emotional six months for me now. <laughs> do you know, I'd be more practical, do you know. Yeah. Like, I'd often go to bed at night and uh, there'd be tears running down my face and I'd say, shit, am I crying? And I'd have to call somebody in the house and Am I crying? <laughs> well, go back over your day. Did anything happen today that upset you? And I go back over it. And then I could just hit something. And next thing the tears would stop. But I wouldn't feel the emotion connected to the tear. Do you get me? Yeah. And I'd probably be. I'm very honest. Like. I say it as it is. Come on, hit me with an honest bomb. <laughs> Do you know what I say it as it is? Your hair <laughs> shite, David. <laughs> No, I'd say it as it is. Like, I'm, I'd am i be very practical. Um, if I see something nice in somebody, I tell them. You know, I the little things that bother other people don't bother me. You know, I just say it as it is. And if I can make somebody happy or say something that might... It's funny that the smallest thing could make somebody's day and we don't realise it. You know, mm. by being in a shop and smiling at somebody and... My kids have often said to me, Jesus Christ, did you have to say that to your one? But she looked lovely. We were in the shop, you know, in the morning getting a coffee and could be somebody there dressed up and she could look fabulous. And I'd say, you know what, you look great. I love your outfit. As a man, you can't do that anymore. You'd be arrested. No, but I don't care. I, I don't care whether there's a man or a woman. If I think somebody looks good and I'm beside them in the shop, I'd say, you look great. Love your outfit. What's the big feckin' deal in giving somebody a compliment? It's a tricky world we're living in now. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? But that's I know. just... I know, I know. No, you're right. And that's just me. You know, I, I'm not great at taking compliments. I'm brilliant at dishing Oh, well, you're them. an Irish woman. Irish women aren't. Is Vicky look lovely? Fuck off. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> What's wrong with you? I don't. I'm, I'm like a, I'm like a bore. <laughs> yeah. I don't mean, if that was... I Thanks a million for coming on. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. No, there's no bother. I'm still all bunged up. I had an awful dose during the week, so the voice is still a bit hoarse. I'm sure, look, most people don't know what you sound like previous to this, so they'll think yeah, that yeah. you just sound like you. Well, that's your one with the hoarse voice. Yeah. When's your book coming out again? I'm hoping that I'll have it out in March for the anniversary of the crash. What's it called? Have After, you name picked? Oh, yeah. After the crash, journey to a place called home. That's cool. Uh, what's your campaign called again? I don't really have a campaign oh, calling sorry. it anything. I'm just trying to get a legislation brought mm. in. I mean, how do you campaign 
mental health. Yeah. I mean, I've been called numerous names online. I have. Have been. people give you attacked you online? Yeah. For what? For saying that I'm targeting mental health. I mean, I've even had relations fall out with me, where they thought I was targeting mental health, but. As I said, mental health falls under a very big umbrella. You know, you can break an arm and you can have different types of breaks. You can have a fracture, you can have a clean break or it can be severed. Or, do you know what I mean? There's mm. different types of everything. Yeah, and if you were to target mental health um, per se for driving, there'd be none of us on the road. We'd be all off the road. Mm. Well, that's why long form conversation like this is important because you can't, these little snippets and uh, just can be edited as if you're attacking a certain yeah. you know amount of individuals but this time last year i have to say fair juice to sarah Clark, um td she brought it up in the doll and she had said that it was very very worrying these one car collisions and also you know driving the wrong way down the bypass there's been a few of them i mean that whole family that was wiped out in van the slow last year do you remember that mm. that was preventable you know he was known to the guards he had mental health issues he still had the keys of a car. You know, even if they were, and I spoke to Circus Secretary in the Clone, Geraldine um, O'Rourke, she has been out on her own to me. She's always at the other end of the phone. She never stopped, you know, helping me, no matter what I wanted. And um, Circus brought it up in the doll, this time last year, actually, where even if you go down the wrong way on the bypass, that if there was some kind of, there's not even signs stop wrong way turn back there's not even a sign do you know what i mean we just take it for granted that you're not going to go down the wrong way but we have so many foreign nationals in our country now that are you know they drive in the opposite side of the road of course it can happen it can happen to anybody but if there was something that if you went down the wrong side of the road that something would come up and puncture your tires there's ways of doing loads of things Fucking bazooka come out. <laughs> There's ways to do it. I mean, I have, over the years since the crash, I can tell you, I have met some lunatics on the road. I was nearly wiped off the road about six months ago. Um, I was coming into Athlone on the bypass. Driving nice and steady. Don't overtake, don't do anything. I don't even go over mm. the speed limit, right? So I'm driving nice and steady. This car comes up behind me. I'm on the fast lane and there's a white transit van on the slow lane. Now you can imagine he's here. So the front of my car is where literally his bumper's here and I'm here. So it's like all room for any car to come in and slide out. Up this fella comes right up behind me, overtakes me and cuts right in between me and the van. Now, I mean, how he didn't hit me and hit your man. It would have been a three car collision. I rang the guards. I said... You have to follow him. You have to do something. I gave the reg like he was off the wall. Like I've often followed cars. <laughs> oh, <come> on, <laughs> I've often followed them. <laughs> I genuinely have. I've often said, I get my hands on him. He's a dead man. I mean, it's not until you've been in a crash like I was in. Well, when you're on the road every day, say I would have been yeah. on the road for two hours in the morning, two hours in the evening. Yeah. Then I drove a lorry. You see, you see it all. Yeah. And there's some, you know, people make mistakes. People lose concentration for a minute. Yeah. And, you know, accidents happen. They are, when I mean, you have that many people on the road using them, accidents will happen. Yeah. But when you have, like you said, preventable, preventable measures. measures that can be in place. Because everyone's supposed to drive with care and everyone is supposed to have all safety things working in their car and seat belts and not be drunk and not be drugged up. Yeah. So it's practical things that people could change. But yeah. that's a the mental health thing is if, if someone's psychotic, God, it's scary that they can be. And I know that on prime time or one of them things in the last few years, they had a thing about esulfidine and sulfidol and all these, you know, when it comes to driving and what do you do in a case like that? And I know that's down to traffic medicine. And I have to say, Professor O'Neill, um, I spoke with a man. He's a lovely man. Um, he listened to everything that I had to say. And they did bring in measures. They have done. Um, and there is legislation and they have up the fines. Uh, you know, if you're caught with your mobile phone, mm. uh, there's loads of things they've done. And to be fair, fair play to them. They have done it. 
but they've yet to do something around mental health. Mm. And I can't understand why they're not because it'll save lives. I think just there's no resources in the HSE. I know it's a very... Uh, I don't even know if it's about the resources. I mean, it's a very vicious circle at the minute. But for every person that's seriously injured in a road collision, they're on disability benefit because they have disabilities for the rest of their life. So it's very much... Now, Ev, come on. You know our government don't think about things that are down the road. It's <laughs> right, only right now. I know, and the just, next four <laughs> years until they get voted in again. That's now how it works. Did you not hear about how they're sorting their energy prices? <laughs> You know, drive an electric car, right? Get rid of all the coal, fl- the, the peat plants and get rid of this and get rid of that. No fires in your house and nobody has electricity. The price of electricity is going up. And now to, because they know they're going to have an energy shortage next year. You hear about this? Buying these jet engines. <laughs> they're spending nearly a billion on these jet engines that are going to use more fuel than anything else to generate emergency power. So we, we, we have a country that's run by donkeys, right? Because they're just trying to get into power, to tell everyone what they want to hear, they get into power, and then all they're worried about is just staying in power. The political system is just a little bit broken. It's very fragmented, mm. isn't it? It's extremely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is. Well, Maeve, again, thanks a million for coming on. Really well, appreciate it. When your book me. is out, I'll give it an old plug. And I'm sorry for frightening you <laughs> coming in. It'll look <laughs> a lot better with, next time. <laughs> how many friends are we going to have in here? How many is coming home with me tonight? <laughs> That's what I, I was know, thinking. It's, it's grand. It's grand. It'll be done. It'll be done. Because when grand. I drove in and there was no cars, I went, that pin dropped in the wrong place. I'll have to ring David and see. I, I just said to Matt, we came up here. I put the book on the, I never opened it up after. And I said, I better go down here. It's very dark. And then I seen people coming up the stairs. I said, oh, no. She's going to think now this is uh, luring her to somewhere nasty. No, I just took one look and I went, there's more here than meets the eye. <laughs> there definitely is. <laughs> well, um, anyway, I hope you have a great Christmas. And the kids I was uh, asking for them. I really do. And uh, thanks a million. Thanks. Okay. I'll it's see you all next week. Anymore. <laughs> no, it was. Well, look, they're all, all your kids. Yeah, it's true. All, all your babies, kids. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Thanks a million. Well, all right. All right, Matt.